Chapter 7 A Mysterious Arrow Dad's observations about seeing an extra person in the background of the film greatly excited the other cubs. Show the scene again, they begged Mr. Holloway. The den dad rethreaded the film into the projector machine and ran it through at slow speed. There he is, suddenly exclaimed Dan, catching the first glimpse of the unfamiliar face in the scene. Before he obtained a definite impression of the person, the figure had ducked back into the bushes. Golly, exclaimed Red in amazement, where did he pop in from? Couldn't it have been one of the cubs from Den 1, demanded Fred. Dan reminded the boys that during the filming of the banquet scene, all the cubs had taken part. Someone was watching us from the bushes, Brad confirmed the younger boy's opinion. Too bad we didn't get a clearer impression of him. At the request of the cubs, Mr. Holloway ran through the film a third time. However, it was impossible for anyone to identify the stranger in the scene. Mr. Holloway, Dan, and Brad were of the opinion that the intruder was another boy. The others thought he had looked older and might be a man. At any rate, we know there's a little substance to our ghosts of the castle, Dan laughed. Maybe next time we're out there, we can catch him. I don't like the idea of being spied on. Mr. Holloway and Mr. Hatfield devoted some time to discussing the various scenes of the play with the boys, pointing out where improvement could be made. For the movie, we'll need titles, the Den Dad explained. Also, it will be necessary to do a great deal of editing and cutting in the final version. We'll need a committee. Make Dan chairman, suggested Brad. He knows the Robin Hood story better than anyone. I'll appoint Dan, Red, and Chips, Mr. Holloway said. There will be plenty of work to do because we must start the final film editing by next Saturday, which means that we'll have to speed up the archery contest, added Sam Hatfield. To avoid argument, the winner of the match shall have the role of Robin Hood. Fair enough, grinned Dan. Aware that costumes for the play would be needed in a hurry, the boy promised to turn their money in as quickly as possible so that material could be bought. During the early part of the week, the cubs of both Den 1 and Den 2 canvassed the neighborhood seeking off odd jobs. As Dan already had observed, they were discouragingly scarce. Except for Ross Langdon, not a single cub was certain of earning the amount needed within the short period of time. What we should have is a project all the boys can work on together, Brad declared one night as he and Dan discussed the problem. We might gather and sell papers. The market has collapsed. I've already investigated that job, that job possibility. At this time of year, all the odd jobs are taken, Dad's, Dan said gloomily. So it's dry. Even the lawns hardly need cutting. I know, Brad agreed. City Council has warned folks to go easy on using water. The pressure is low. Even vacant lots with so many dried weeds present a hazard. Dan stared at the older boy as an idea suddenly came to him. Say, maybe that's the ticket, he exclaimed. What is, Dan? I don't follow you. Why, maybe the cubs could get the job from the city cutting weeds. The city has its own crew. Sure, but not half of the outlying areas have been mowed. I read in the paper yesterday the city is having trouble finding workers. Brad thought the matter over. We never could sell our service to the city, he said, but we might get individual jobs for the Cubs, especially from real estate men who have considerable vacant properties. There's a lot of it near the castle, Dan recalled. We might be able to round up a few jobs in that area. The two boys discussed the matter and in a f and with a few from the organization members had been successful in earning enough money. Everyone except Ross Langdon immediately favored the job. Ross declared that to cut weeds would inflame his nose and bring on an attack of hay fever. 
Anyway, I have more than enough money now for my Robin Hood costume, he said smugly. No weed cutting for me. Okay, Brad shrugged. Suit yourself. Don't forget, though, that you have that you have a section of ground at the castle to clear before next Saturday. We gave our promise to the bank that it would be done. The next morning, Brad and Dad, Dan set out to see how many jobs they could obtain for the Cubs. After trying four places, they were giving, given the promise of one small one. With all of the Cubs working, Brad calculated it would take an hour for the boys to clean up the premises. We'll need at least another sizable job to make it worthwhile, Dan commented as the two boys paused for a moment on the highway. But where will we get it? Brad had noticed a well-kept property directly ahead on the right side of the road. Orchards were surrounded by an artistically built wooden rail fence. However, tall dried weeds had grown about the rails. Should a fire start from a dropped match or cigarette, not only the fence, but the orchard as well might be damaged. Let's try that place ahead, Brad proposed. We could grub out those weeds by hand in two or three hours. It would make the grounds look better and eliminate the fire hazard. The boys could not see the house from the main road. Seeking it, they followed the winding lane through attractively laid out grounds. Presently, they came within view of the large white house with two pillars supporting a veranda. In their immediate path was a small one-room shack, which evidently served as the garden tools house. Well, I suppose someone is home, Dan remarked. We've had a long, hard walk. Even as he spoke, a short, wiry man in overalls came out of the garden house. You boys want something? he asked, blocking their way. Why, yes, said Brad. He explained that he and Dan were Cub Scouts in search of odd jobs for their organization. Well, there's nothing here for you, the man answered briefly. We'd like to talk to the owner of the property, if you please. You can't see him. The master doesn't like visitors. Who is the owner? inquired Dan curiously. Never mind. The point is, you'll find no work here. I attend to all the odd jobs. You do fine at keeping the property in order, declared Brad, his gaze roving over the well-trimmed shrubs. But we noticed one thing you've overlooked. Oh, you did, eh? Despite Brad's polite manner, the gardener was, more, was growing more and more irritated. Trying to be diplomatic as possible, the boys told of their need to earn money for costumes. Then they mentioned the uncut weeds along the front fence, stressing the danger of fire. I have enough to do around here without pulling those weeds, the man exclaimed. What's more, I won't take it on. That's where we come in, said Brad. For a few moderate fee, the cubs will do the job of cleaning them out. Oh, no, you won't. The gardener now was very angry. You're trying to make me look bad with the boss. Well, you can't see him. Now, get out of here before I get the dogs loose. You have us all wrong, Dad protested. We're not trying to get anyone in trouble, but the work should be done and get out. Dan would have stood his ground, but Brad pulled him away. Come on, Dan, he said quietly. We'll find another place. No use stirring up trouble. Feeling very annoyed at having been so rudely dismissed, the two boys started away. They rounded a point in the road which blocked off their view of the gardener and the tool house. That stupid lug, Brad snorted. He's afraid we'll make him look bad. As the bo boys spoke the words, an object whizzed through the air, flying high above his head. It lodged in the tree at the side of the lane. What was it? Brad demanded, startled. An arrow, Dan exclaimed. Say, someone is using us for target. We'd better take cover. Da-do-da-do. Da,